All right, today we're going to be talking about salinity and looking at the salinity of our global oceans. Now on maps and in diagrams, salinity is often represented with this S with the parts per thousand um, notation behind it. Um, now, when we go and we want to understand what salinity is, this is um, the measurement of the total amounts of the dissolved inorganic solids in our seawater. So just to have all that, it's the total amount or concentration of our dissolved inorganic um, solids in seawater. When we go and we look at the world's oceans, um, we see a range of salinity uh, from 33 to 37 parts per thousand. The average salinity of our oceans is about 35 parts per thousand. Okay, now when we go and we want to try to start understanding what our salinity is, the next question that comes up is what are these solids that make up our seawater? If we were to go and kind of take a whole bucket of seawater and scoop it up and let it sit and dissolve, uh, evaporate away, and then take a look at all the residue that's left behind, we find seven major ions make up the majority of those salts that we see in our seawater. So, all right, the most abundant, good things to know. The very first one kind of comes as no surprise is our chlorine. And the second most abundant is our sodium. What I find interesting is that again, when we think about seawater, we think about salt, um, the top two ions that make up the most of those salts are sodium and chloride, which together, if the water evaporates away, these would combine together and make our table salt. Okay, number three on our list is our sulfate. SO4 followed by number four, we have magnesium. Uh, calcium, oops, and we have six, seven, potassium makes up number six, and our seventh is our bicarbonate, which is H3, that's a C, HCO3, and then it's got a negative one charge. Um, so all of these, uh, this whole list is the most abundant ions from top to bottom. Um, there are other things, um, basically everything else, our trace elements would make up number eight. Um, this is just different metals. All of these things um, that we find on our earth are present in our oceans at very, very tiny amounts, uh, less than 1%. Um, so they're not listed here. Um, now when we go and we start to look at all of these things, the big question is where did they all come from? So when we think about the oceans and we think about kind of what goes into it, we can really start to see some things. We see rivers um, running down the earth and going into the oceans. So river inputs are one place that we do see these ions coming from. Um, as the water flows over the land, it will start to weather the rocks. And then from those rocks, we create these, some of these ions that go into our, into our oceans. But not all of them are found in our river water. Um, some of them are actually released through volcanic outgassing. So as the volcano erupts, it's gonna be putting out things like magnesium, 
you'll start to see some sulfate coming out um, and that volcanic eruption process is part of where our water came from originally too. Um, so with the water vapor and um, some of these ions, all of that material is getting added into our oceans. And you might really easily think that if this is constantly getting added into the oceans, our oceans must be getting saltier over time. But that's not the case. Instead, what we find is that our average salinity over time is constant. So the amounts of salts that we see and the ratio of those different ions in relationship to each other stays constant over time. We have what's called a steady state equilibrium. which means that the amount that is added in on average over all of the oceans equals the amount that's removed. So we're left behind with this constant average global salinity of 35 parts per thousand. So the question is where or how are all of these ions removed? And they're removed by the process of the rock cycle. So we create more sediments. Um, those ions are going to precipitate out of water onto the bottom of the seafloor. That's one way. Um, we do have organisms in the water column that start to pull those ions out of the seawater to make their shells, uh, like our foraminifera. They take calcium and the bicarbonate, and they're going to create a calcium carbonate shell um, that is in the water column, but it's now no longer part of um, the dissolved ions. That's another way that we can remove it. Um, then again, um, when that organism dies and it starts to sink to the bottom of the seafloor, its shell becomes some of those sediments that we talked about. Um, we also have um, minerals that are precipitating on the bottom of the seafloor that are removing these ions. And we have plate tectonics that's happening. Um, as the ocean, uh, the oceanic lithosphere is moving around, um, it is subducted into our subduction zones. And as it goes down, it takes the crust, it takes the lithosphere and all the sediment sitting on top and it starts to wedge it down into that subduction zone. Again, removing these ions from the seawater. So the amount that is added is equal to the amount that's being removed. Um, we do, when we're talking about this, I'm talking about the average ocean salinity, but we do see variations when we look around our oceans. Um, one thing that we notice is that we have places of lower salinity. And these are, we'll call it lower local salinity. Okay, um, now when we want to go and understand why we might have lower salinity in a place, we have to think about what makes water salty. This is a place where we have inputs of fresh water. So if we think about it, the most obvious place that we have uh, inputs, this is our sea level, and here we have a nice river moving water into the oceans. And as that water comes down, while it might be picking up some ions from weathering, um, overall the water is much lower in salinity than the seawater. So our sea uh, salinity at this location goes down. Big rivers that have high um, outputs, lots and lots of water that it's adding into the oceans are associated with these local lowering in salinity. Two big rivers to remember that do this um, would be the Amazon and the Ganges. Okay, so we do see when we look at that global salinity map that right around um, the mouth of these rivers, we see lower salinity. In places, um, another way that we can have an input of fresh water is if we were to, I'll just draw it here, big cloud, and we have heavy precipitation. That's also going to lower the salinity in that area. Our seasonal monsoons lead to um, a lowering of the salinity in the places that they, they occur. Um, one place this is really apparent is in the Bay of Bengal. So we have addition of seawater and also these monsoon rains, so we see definitely a lot lower salinity uh, in this area. Now the next thing we would want to understand is, well, where is the high salinity? Where is that going to be? Because we do certainly find higher salinity areas. 
And in order to understand why we would have higher salinity, we need to just think about the process in reverse. These are places where we see lots of evaporation. Um, so as we start to evaporate water out, all the salts get left behind, so our salinity in that area is going to be higher. Um, one place that we see this happening is in the centers of our oceans. They are in general higher than others, um, especially in our Atlantic Ocean. So the water way out there, it's isolated, doesn't have lots of precipitation, um, and we're going to start to see more evaporation leading to a higher sal salinity, kind of in the middle of our ocean basins. Another place that we see it are in kind of these more isolated uh, water bodies. So um, if you were to think about, let's see, Gibraltar, here we have, this is our Atlantic Ocean, and this can be our Mediterranean Sea. Um, in this area, the Mediterranean Sea is pretty isolated. Um, water does flow in and out through um, Gibraltar into there, but it's actually not a lot. Um, so the Mediterranean Sea becomes more isolated. As it's isolated, warm temperatures, we're going to start to see evaporation, and that's going to lead to an increase in the local salinity. So the Mediterranean Sea is much higher. Another place that we see this same process happening would be in the Arabian Sea. Again, places where we don't have as much input of fresh water, we have lots of evaporation, so we see higher salinity getting left behind. All right. Now the lung that I wanted to talk about in discussing local changes in salinity is the role of sea ice. So if we just go and we draw in our continent, and we can say that this is Antarctica, we have our sea level, and then we'll just imagine that we have a big block of ice, our glacier sitting there. Again, Antarctica is a great way to imagine this. Um, sea ice formation is very interesting. When water is taken up to make ice, all the extra stuff, all of those dissolved ions, they're all excluded. So ice is very pure. If you go and you collect it, you can melt it and drink it. Um, you get the picture. So when we have periods of cooler temperatures, it's going to lead to the formation of ice. As the water is taken up out of the water and added to our glacier, we're going to find that the local salinity starts to go up. And that's again because all of those dissolved ions are excluded from the ice. Okay, so if we just go and look at the opposite, if we start to have warmer temperatures, it's going to get melting. And as we go and we start to melt our glacier, the opposite happens. So if we take away part of it, this is water is now going back into the ocean. And it's just going to continue adding more and more of that ice. So that water now gets added and our salinity, which was high before, is going to start to decrease. Okay, again, because of that input of additional ice. Um, so all of these factors together should help you get an understanding. When you look at a map of global salinity and you see places where it's higher in some places and where it's lower in other places, you can start to try to think and figure out what processes on Earth, evaporation, ice formation, precipitation, uh, runoff, um, what's playing a role in changing the local salinity, and then remembering again that our average ocean salinity is 35 parts per thousand. I hope that was helpful.